right, hey there everybody. So in this video, I'm actually going to be going over some important concepts for our dynamic pinning chapter. This video is not gonna be any techniques in particular. It is not going to be uh, any, anything that's gonna be drawn from any one of our weeks from this chapter in particular. Rather, these are gonna be some overall general guiding principles that I want you to work with uh, when you guys are working in, uh, in this dynamic pinning chapter, when you're looking to hold your opponent down in any of these five pins, okay? There are five pins in the sport of jiu-jitsu. There are variations of each of those five pins. There are more than uh, five total. For instance, we have side control. But within side control, just one of the pins, there are a lot of different variations. Okay? So let's go through what all the, um, all the different five major pins are, just so you guys have a general idea of what those are, and then we'll move on from there. Okay? So Adam, if you can lay down, just in front of the camera here. First, um, let's bring it up a little closer to the line, a little closer to the camera, awesome. So first and foremost, we have side control. Okay? Inside control, my hips are between Adam's hip line and his shoulder line. If my hips remain within his hip line and his shoulder line, we have variations of side control. Now typically in side control, we typically want at least one of our arms on the far side of the body. Okay, either here or here. We could even go here, um, but I prefer to have one on each side. We'll, we'll, and these are more in-depth details. We'll get to these later on throughout the month. But this is side control. The second pin is going to be north-south, okay? Where in north-south, rather than my hips being south of Adam's shoulder line, my hips are going to be here, over his shoulder line. My head and shoulders are south of the shoulder line, but my hips over here are above the shoulder line, and these are going to be variations of north-south. We have different variations of these depending on what my opponent tries to do to escape, but understand this is another one of the pins. So we have side control where my hips are below his shoulder line, and north-south where my hips are above the shoulder line. Could you put your head to the camera? Pull your head just a little bit. Yeah. Third is a knee mount where I'm going to take my knee and I'm going to place it on Adam's stomach just like so, so that I'm facing his head. Now, the other prerequisite for knee mount, or the other condition, is I need my free knee, the other one, off the floor, okay? If I put one of my knees on Adam's stomach, and this other knee is off the floor, we have a knee mount. Now, the knee mount is not a particularly strong and robust pin. It's more of a floating pin. So we don't typically try to hold knee mount for long periods of time but rather the knee mount will be used either as a great staging position to transition into the mount or as a means of uh, creating defensive reactions in my opponent that are going to open them up to submission opportunities where I can start isolating and attacking limbs. So our third pin is knee mount. So these three pins are what I call side pin variations where my legs and hips are off to the side of that. Okay? So, side control, north-south, and knee mount are all side pin variations. Those account for three of our pins. There's two more pins, mount and back control, and I call these straddle pins, where my two legs straddle my opponent's upper body. My, I have a knee I place on either side of him so that his body is between my two knees. Now we can have a straddle pin where I'm chest to chest, and this is the mount position, great position, great for attacking. Or we can have straddle positions where my opponent turns, broken, and I have back control, where again, Adam's torso is between my two knees, and now, rather than being chest to chest, now I'm chest to back. So those are our two straddle pins. We have mount, where he's between my knees and we're chest to chest. And then we have this one, back control, where he's between my two knees and I'm chest to back. So back control, and the mount position. Those are our two straddle pins. So we have three side pins and two straddle pins. 
Now, let's start going over some important concepts for dynamic pinning, okay? There's always going to be a fight for inside position. If Adam is down, uh, let's say side control, just lay across. Yep, perfect. If I'm here, uh, yeah, this is good. I want to stay inside Adam's elbows as much as possible. So if Adam goes to try to use his elbows to push into me and push and make space, or to maybe put his hands on me and use his hands to make space, he can't because I'm inside the elbows. Okay, so unfortunately I can never get inside the elbows and then just hold indefinitely because I always need to be progressing towards submission. And because he's always gonna be writhing, moving, bumping, shrimping, creating as little, creating some sort of space so he can eventually slip an elbow to the inside position. Now that he gets one elbow to the inside position, that's gonna help him make enough space to get a second elbow to the inside position. And that will get enough space for him to bring a third and then a fourth limb. And now he's getting more and more inside position. So I wanna, when I'm passing and pinning, I wanna get inside the legs and control the hips. And then I wanna get inside the elbows and control the shoulders. If I can win all the fights for inside position, and if Adam goes to get out of here, I can hold him all night. But of course, Adam knows some good ways to start getting inside position. He's gonna be looking to get one limb inside, then a second and a third and a fourth until he can recover. So there's a perpetual, never ending fight for inside position between the top athlete and the bottom athlete, between the offensive and the defensive, from any, any position, side control, north, south, mount, knee mount, back control. There's always a fight for inside position, okay? That's one important concept for pinning. A second important concept for pinning is understanding that no pin is perfect, but there is perfect pinning. If I were to, if, let's say, uh, let's put your head like so, Adam. If I want to control Adam, and let's say this side control, and I want to just hold this side control forever, and Adam goes to start escaping. Eventually, he's going to escape. There is no pin that is unbeatable. Every pin has an escape that will work. Every single padlock has a key which will open it, okay? So when I'm here, if I feel, let's move you again, I'm sorry. If I feel like maybe Adam is starting to push and make, um, just like he was doing before, and I'm starting to push and make space, and I feel like there's a danger of this knee coming in. Let's go a little slower. And I feel like there's a danger of that knee coming in. I'm gonna place a wedge maybe here in the pocket of his hip. So Luck and I went from a position where I was on two knees to where I pulled my right knee off the floor so I could slouch my left hip into his hip. Okay, so this would be another variation of side control. Um, we're gonna go through the technical details of this uh, later. For this, I call a near hip hip wedge, where my target is the near hip, and the tool I'm using is my own hip as a wedge. So a near hip, hip wedge. We also have near hip, near hip knee wedges, where I target his near hip and I use my knee as a wedge. And again, we'll get into all these details later, but just understanding that I cannot just sit in one variation of a pin and expect to hold this forever. As Adam works to escape, I might have to go in with a near hip elbow block. So now when he tries to bring those knees in, he can't, okay? Now let's say Adam tries to go into an overhead elbow escape. And so I go into a far hip shoulder wedge to shut the knees out. Okay, so there's always going to be different variations of pins that you're going to have to transition and move between if you want to hold him down for long periods of time. You cannot realistically expect a single pin to hold him down indefinitely if he knows what he's doing. Rather, your skill is going to be working on learning to transition from one variation of a pin to another or from one different pin to another different pin. It could be from side pin to a straddle pin, from side control to north-south, or it can just be with working within different variations of side control. One variation of side control to another variation of side control, etc. But understand that you have to be moving on top because every time, let's say if I'm here, let's move you a little bit this way, Adam. If I come up here, my elbow does a great job of shutting out his head and shoulders, so it might be hard for Adam to get this frame in, but I'm not blocking the hips, so Adam can move his hips and get his knee in. 
Okay, I say, well, Adam, you think you're so smart. I'm gonna make sure you can't get those hips in. I'm gonna be down here, I'm gonna control the hips. But now we can start getting this frame in. And now we can use this fr these two frames together to start making space and pushing me away. And now it's hard for me to stay on the hips. Okay. So now I'm thinking, okay, Adam, you know, you're starting to get, um, I can't keep my hip tight, so you're gonna be pushing me away. Maybe I block your hip with my arm. But now he goes into his overhead elbow escape, and now he brings in the knees in a different direction. Okay? So I cannot realistically rely on just a single pin to hold him down. I'm gonna have to learn to move and adapt so that my pin counters all of his escape attempts. So as he's escaping, we're gonna be changing our pinning strategy to accommodate and stop, stop his escape attempts. Okay? Um, wedging and basing dilemma is another important concept uh, for pinning, okay? I do that. When I'm here, I want to I take all the inside position for myself. And the best way to do that is to stay as super tight as possible. So if Adam were to try to get any sort of inside position here, absolutely no way. But it came at a price. I had to take everything in super tight. I'm squeezing everything super in tight. It's, it's artificial. If Adam were to give a strong bridge, he's going to take me over. He's going to throw me out of balance, sit up to top position, etc. If I go in the other extreme, if I go in the other extreme, and I say, okay, he flipped me over. I'm going to make sure I don't get flipped over this time. And now Adam goes to escape. He gets all the inside position very easily. He gets back to guard. So we are constantly playing this dilemma between trying to tightly wedge everything around my partner so they can't move and so they can't get inside position, but also trying to keep a wide base so I don't get turned over. So how do we simultaneously stay in tight so they don't get inside position while simultaneously staying wide and, and low so they don't bridge us over and off balance us and the solution I have for this is I use my elbows and my knees generally to set wedges around the body and I'll use my hands and my feet spread out as wide as I can for base so I keep I keep my elbows and my knees tight that's priority number one and I'll get my hands and my feet as far as I can without having to sacrifice the wedging without having to move my elbows. So if Adam is down in side control, let's say I might wedge my knee tightly against the hips and the shoulders on this side, but I've got the balls of my feet, rotate, and I've got the balls of my feet on the mat here so I have a good base of support. My feet aren't tucked underneath me. I've got my feet out here as a base, okay? On this side, I set the cross face. I don't reach and grab his head with my hand. I control and set the wedge with the elbow and my hands a base. Same with my underhook. I go elbow deep and I control him through my two elbows. It's my two elbows pinching together that control Adam and it's my hands here that it can either choose to set closed wedges or use a base. So now between my elbows and my knees tightly pinching, if Adam tries to get inside position, it's very hard. But between my hands and my feet basing, if Adam goes to bridge, it's hard for him to bridge or, or move me. So that's one of the best solutions I've found for solving the wedging and basing dilemma for the top athlete, is to use the middle of your limbs, the knees and the elbows, to wedge, and to use the ends of your limbs, the hands and the feet, to base. Okay? Excuse me. See, next up on, on my script here. Okay, we're on to the three rules, the three goals, and the three skills of dynamic pinning. There are three rules that you want to obey while you're pinning. There are three goals that you're working toward. And there are three motor skills you're going to have to develop if you want to become successful at applying this knowledge. Okay, so three rules, three goals, three skills. The three rules. You want to stay behind your opponent as much as possible. If I can ever take Adam's elbow, pass it across my body and I can stay outside of his elbow and he goes to turn and face me and I stay here behind the elbow, I can stay behind him. And if I can stay behind him, I have a, I have a significant advantage. The human body is set up to fight and be strong and defend attacks very well from the front. 
very poorly from the rear. So we, we always want to exploit that. So if, it ever, if it's ever possible to get behind your opponent, get behind your opponent. That's one of the three rules. The second rule, stay on top. So we've seen stay behind, now we're seeing stay on top. If at any point, um, you know, there's a scramble that ensues if I'm here and Adam starts to escape and we're kind of, in this kind of scenario, there's gonna be a fight for top position. If one of us is gonna end up on top, I'd rather it be me. So if you're starting to lose the ability to stay behind your opponent, make sure you get on top of your opponent, okay? We're, we're getting a little out of frame, Adam, coming this way, thank you. Um, and then the third rule is to stay away from the legs. Keep the legs out of the equation. We've already done a lot of good work by passing our opponent's guard, um, or however it happened, we ended up passing their guard, we ended up passing their legs. We do not want those legs to come back in. That is a big pain in the butt. So if I am gonna get on top, let's say he's down, let's put your head this way. There you go. If I'm here, let's say, and Adam's starting to curl his body up toward me, his legs are getting too close to me for comfort. I do not like that. He's starting to get his knees inside. I wanna block, get a wedge in the pocket of the hip, and I wanna get away from the legs. I wanna stay away from those legs as much as possible. And one of the keys, to staying away from the legs is to keep wedges in the pocket of the hip because I can use these wedges to dominate his knee position. When Adam wants to bring his knees tight to his chest and make himself into a ball so I can't get into side control. But when I get wedges in the pocket of the hip, when he brings his knees to his chest, as tight, tight as he can, I can always force those knees away from the chest and I can dominate the knees by controlling the pocket of the hip. Okay, when I control the pocket of the hip, I can apply pressure to the low femur and control the femur, which allows me to control the knees. So the three rules of pinning, stay behind your opponent, stay on top of your opponent, and stay away from their legs. Okay? Now, the three goals of dynamic pinning, okay, if those are the, if those are the three rules, the three things you should be obeying, what are the three things you should be actively engaged in and actively doing, actively working toward? The first goal is defensive responsibility, which is what we just said. Stay away from the legs. Stay behind, stay on top, stay away from the legs. That will ensure defensive responsibility. We always want to keep those legs shut up, controlling the pocket of the hips so the hips can't come in. Okay? Once we have defensive responsibility met, once we can keep those legs out, your second goal is to be funneling your opponent. Meaning we want to be taking away more and more of their options. Understand that from a situation like this where I have no, where I have no contact with Adam, he can move his, his body in a number of different ways. He can turn toward me, turn away from me, invert, uh, sit up. He can, uh, I mean, so many different things he can do. Okay, hip pipes, whatever. But as I come in, and let's say I get in, let's say, let's say to this position, I have some inside position. Well, he can't super easily turn in or away from me right now because if he tries to turn into me, I'm kind of blocking the elbow. If he tries to turn away from me, his elbow's blocking him here. Okay? So now all he can do is really push. So we're taking away his options. Um, now let's say he decides, you know, he starts pushing, and now I get inside the elbows. And now that I'm inside the elbows, now he can't push me. Okay? So now one of his only options would be to try to turn away. Okay? He's lost the ability to push. Now he's turning. I let him turn. And now we let him go to here. And now, I mean, now his options are really starting to get limited. His head and shoulders are under control. He, can, he might be able to start to walk his legs and hips away or, you know, try to move. But I'm going to be able to pull his head and pull everything. And I'm, I'm slowly taking away his options and I'm funneling him into these areas of the game where I can control him and he can't control me. So we want to be continually taking away all of our partner's options until we get to the third and final goal, which is to attack, to submit. We want to be taking away incrementally all of our partner's options until they are left with just two choices. Either surrender or pass out from a choke or have your limb uh, damaged or injured from a joint lock. So we want to continually take away more and more options, funneling our opponent, until we get to that third goal of dynamic pinning, submission. Where, they are, where they're left literally with just two more, they have literally two options. Tap out or suffer the consequences of not tapping, okay? Now, so those are the three goals. What about the three skills? We got the three 
uh, rules. Stay behind, stay on top, stay away from the legs. We have your three goals, things that you're working for. Keep their legs out of your way, defensive responsibility. Funnel them, and then eventually submit them. And now we're on to our three skill sets. The three things you're gonna be, need to be able to do if you wanna be an effective dynamic pinner. Those three skill sets are maintaining one pin. If Adam goes to, to escape from side control, go ahead, do, do some escapes. And maintaining one variation of a pin. We're getting a little close to the end, let's come this way. So you're, the skill to maintain in, in that scenario is maintaining side control. But you can learn to maintain north-south, maintain uh, mount, maintain back control. We don't maintain knee mount a whole lot, uh, so we won't touch on that much. It's more of a touch and go pin, but the ability to maintain a single pin. The second skill is the ability to transition from one pin to another as he is escaping. So when I'm here and Adam's trying to work his escapes, go ahead. My ability, keep going, keep working your escapes, to stay inside and then eventually use that to transition to other variations of pins. Okay, is the second skill you're, need to, you're gonna need to get good at. Then the third skill is extracting a leg. Because every once in a while when I'm trying to you know, work in pins, once in a while you're gonna get an ankle, an ankle trapped. And now you're gonna need to learn how to extract the ankle. But luckily that's a skill you already know how to do. Right, we looked at this during passing half guard. I could use my three quarter side knee up position. Three quarter side knee down. Three quarter mount or reverse three quarter side. And once you guys have those three skill sets of maintaining the pin, so defensive responsibility, or I'm sorry, uh, maintaining a single pin, transitioning from one pin to another pin, and then extracting your ankle, you're gonna have all the skills you need to maintain a pin and work your way to submission over a long period of time. Now, the last thing I wanna leave you guys with before we close off this video, is some basic escapes your opponent might try to do, some basic body movements, and how to deal with these, okay? Things like pushing, uh, things like stripping, bridging, and underhooking, okay? So for a push, Adam, can you put your head toward the camera? Let's say from the mount. Some things you wanna do with a push. If he's pushing into me, I wanna go with the push, okay? If I'm fighting against the push, and now Adam, pushes me off to one side or another, he's gonna have a good strong effect and be able to push me. Get a little close to the cameras. So I'm here, he puts his hands on my chest and I feel him pushing me. I'm not just gonna push back into him. If I push back into him and he pushes into me, I'm gonna get thrown for a ride. So when I feel him pushing me, I move with the push, okay? I take away his power to push me. Another thing I do is I change the angle of the surface. He goes to push, like up on the chest. Yep. If, if I change the angle, say if I, if I go straight up, he loses his pushing surface. If he pushes here and I turn off to the side, he loses his pushing surface. He can only push against the surface comfortably if it's flush against you know, the hands in the direction he wants to push. If that surface starts to shift in angle, he's gonna lose a lot of power. So when I'm down, he goes to push, I change the angle, I'm coming in, he goes to bench press me off again, I go with, I change the angle, he pushes me off, I change, change the angle, eventually he's gonna get tired because he's doing bench press after bench press after bench press. These arms are gonna wear out and he won't be able to keep this up forever. So we move with the push, we angle, we never move into the push. You can do this from side control too. Here he goes to push, I change the angle, okay? If he goes to push and I just push back, eventually he's gonna get these in, things are bad, things are gonna happen. If I'm here, he pushes me, I change the angle. And I kind of ride with the push, okay? So I, I, I take some pressure off, I change the angle, and I kind of melt and, and, and I slide past the push. Um, another common escape is uh, uh, bridging. If I'm here, something Adam might do is bridge me up and over and take me uh, off, uh, off to one side or the other. So some things that you want to do to um, defend against bridging, one is basing. If I'm here and Adam goes to bridge me, I can use my hand for base. 
Remember, I want to keep my elbow tight to the body. I want to keep my elbow tight to the body as a wedge, but it's perfectly fine for me to use my hand for base. So if he bridges to his left, I can use my hand for base. If he bridges to his right, I can use my foot for base. Okay? Another thing that will help bridge him is trying to keep a flat spine. Okay? If I tuck my chin to my chest and I round my spine, I become very easy to roll. So if I keep a really rounded spine here from on the top, it's very easy. I turn I make myself into a ball. So I want to use my back muscles to flatten my spine. I might use my head as an extra post, but I don't want to be rounding my spine like this. That's going to, that's going to be where things are going to get bad if I'm trying to pressure them and round from the top. So I drop my hips, I pick my shoulders up, I make my spine flat, and now when he goes to bridge me, it's not as easy. The last rule, very similar to keeping a flat spine, is try to keep your torso flush to the mat. Right, I always want to keep, imagine if I'm here, like a table. My torso is pretty parallel to the mat. If at any point my torso starts turning and I'm, my torso is not going to be flush to the floor, it starts rotating one way or the other, that's a, a sign that you're going to be very vulnerable to being bridged over. So we want to keep a flat spine and we want to keep our torso flush to the mat. If I'm in the mount position, <coughs> I'm here, night, night, um, kind of slow Adam, and Adam goes to, to bridge. You see how if I keep like this, stop right here. See how I'm letting my, my torso get turned? My left shoulder is raising higher than my right shoulder. I'm going to be bucked over here. But if I'm here and Adam goes to start to bridge, I, I keep my chest, my torso relatively flush to the floor. Now he comes back down and he bridges the other way. Now my left shoulder comes up, my right one goes down a little bit just to help me stay flush to the floor. If he bridges and I let my shoulders get turned, that's where I'm going to get thrown over. So as much as possible, keep a flat spine and, uh, and, and, and keep your torso flush to the floor. Keep good basing. Uh, shrimping is another very common uh, form of defense, uh, uh, side control. Very traditional form of defense. Right here, I'm too close to Adam on this side. My hip and my knee are too close. If he tries to bring his right knee inside, no, nope, no, nope, without shrimping, there's not enough room. So if something Adam wants to do is he wants to move his hips away, that's gonna make more space, and now he has enough space to get that right knee inside. So that's the thing is, he needs to get his hips away. Another thing he needs to do, let's say I'm in here, he brings his knee inside. See what where his head had to move away from me. If he gets this knee inside, but he doesn't move his head away, it's fairly useless. So from here, once he moves his head away, he can now better align himself and uh, uh, recover guard. So, we can stop either the hips from moving away from me, or we can stop the head from moving away from me. And either one of those will stop a shrimp. So if I'm here, and I put an elbow block, a far hip, well again, we'll talk about the details later, but a far hip, elbow block. I use my elbow to block the far hip. Now when Adam goes to trip and make space, my elbow controls his hips. Conversely, maybe if my right arm is being used as a, a near hip elbow block. So not a far hip elbow block, but a near hip elbow block. Um, that, shut, that helps to shut out the shrimp. But, um, or let's say maybe I'm over, maybe I didn't have a good block and he, had, he got this knee in. Another good way that I can stop the shrimp is by blocking the head a reverse cross face. So he could either block the hips or block the head. Now, even though the knee's inside, when Adam goes to fully recover guard, it's not easy. This will hold his head in place long enough that when he recovers, I can now refine the pocket of the hip, shut that leg out, and I can maintain the pin. I can shut out his shrimp escape. So we can shut out the shrimp escape by either controlling the hips, so his hips can't get far enough away to get in the inside, or if we feel like him getting a knee inside is going to be inevitable, we can try to stop the head from moving away. So now when he tries to recover guard, he can't, and we can slow him down long enough to swim back inside his knee, shut his knee back out, and recover um, our, our pin. Okay, so those are a couple good ways to deal with shrimping. Either wedge around the hips, 
and stop the hips from moving away or wedge around the head and stop the head from moving away. So we've looked at uh, pushing, we looked at bridging, we looked at shrimping. Let's look at underhooking, another very common form of escape. If I'm in side control, Adam wants to get this underhook in so he can turn into me, get underneath my arm, and either go to my back or wrestle. So one great way to stop the underhook escape is with our own underhook. Now when he tries to turn into me like he did before, I can flatten the top shoulder because I can drive into him and look, look at how my shoulder catches his arm and it flattens his arm and his far shoulder. So we can stop his underhook escape by getting our own underhook. If he punches in an underhook and I have enough space, I can use this cross bicep post. He punches an underhook, I cross bicep post, re-pummel, and I reclaim my own underhook. Okay, so we can use the far side underhook to stop his underhook escape. I swear you up to the camera. There you go. Another way is a reverse underhook. So we saw that this far side underhook can work. Another one is a reverse underhook. If he's getting an underhook and I feel that I'm losing this fight, and I feel that it's actually dangerous for me to sit back and try to pummel this in because as I sit back to pummel it in, he follows me up, keep following, keep following me, and eventually he just wrestles me and gets on top. So when I feel that maybe it'd be hazardous for me to lean back and try to pummel this one in, I can pummel in this underhook or a reverse underhook. Now when Adam tries to turn up, my reverse underhook flattens him out. I can control the pocket of the near hip, and I've stopped his underhook escape. So we've seen our own, our, we've seen the far side underhook. We can do that with a cross bicep post if needed. And now we've seen the reverse underhook, where I use my other arm as an underhook on the far side. And then the last option I'm going to show you is one that you've, you should have already seen before, I think, a top spin. I'm here, Adam punches in an underhook. I want to make sure the knees don't come back in, so I'm going to put in this whizzer so he can't take my, well, I, and I want to make sure he doesn't take my back. I put in a whizzer, that also, that stops him from taking my back, and then I punch my right arm right here down to the floor to the pocket of the hip, and that uh, stops his elbow escape, just stops him from bringing his knees back in. So now that I have my right arm shutting out both his underhook and his legs, I'm going to use my left arm to step over the head. And now my left arm replaces my right arm. And now my left knee and my left elbow close as I back step. And this is all stuff um, I think you've probably seen in some classes before. So one more time. I'm in here. If he gets an underhook, I can either get my own underhook. I can go reverse underhook. 